Okay. Recording is on. Welcome, everyone. Let's take a moment just to pray, and then we will get started today. All right. Samuel, would you like to please uh, pray so we can get started? Sure, Pastor. Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for adding another day to our lives. We thank you for bringing us together, uh, for being our uh, Jehovah Jireh, for providing for us, for, for this fellowship, for this community, for calling us to your purpose, uh, for aligning our lives according to your very world. Uh, thank you for every life, um, that is here in this class, uh, ready to learn from you. And thank you uh, for the life of Pastor Ashish and everything that you're doing through him and how you've made him a channel of your blessing. Lord, uh, we speak anointing over Pastor uh, for today's class, all the three hours, as we look into uh, apologetics and keys to supernatural ministry. Lord, speak through him and speak through our hearts. Make our hearts fertile ground so that every seed that is sown uh, will be used for your kingdom. You will equip us and build us through this class so that when we go out and when we, you know, and we can uh, further spread your kingdom, uh, be a channel of your blessing to many people around us. Um, we dedicate ourselves and pastor and this class into your hands. Um, thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Good morning or good evening. Good afternoon. <laughs> Everyone, thank you for joining the class today. Uh, sorry about last week. I uh, just had to uh, attend to certain things, and so I, I, yeah, I was away. Um, all right, so uh, we are going to do a lot of uh, catching up. Uh, today we have two hours on apologetics, and um, our goal is um, to discuss, uh, you know, how do we respond to uh, so right now, right now, we are on the topic of the origin of life. How did everything begin? So we went through our chapter on uh, reasons why we believe there's the existence of God and creation. Then uh, two weeks back, we went through the biblical answer to the origin of life, which is Genesis chapter 1. We went through that and we had a lot of questions and we looked at those things, those questions. So Genesis chapter one is the Bible, biblical or the Bible or God's uh, information about the origin of the universe. Now, what we want to do is we want to look at, okay, so what does evolutionary biology say from, uh, from their perspective on the origin of life on earth? Uh, what is... Uh, uh, physicists, what do physicists say if on the origin of this, this universe from their perspective? Now, uh, there is a lot, there is a lot of uh, information out there that, uh, you know, you, you could delve into. But today we are just going to, in a very concise way, communicate that uh, key things uh, so that, I mean, the, uh, my objective is, uh, is just so that you know that there are answers. And uh, you can you can use the same lecture notes if you're you know providing answers, sharing answers to somebody who asks you those questions. But um, I've only you know try to just try to condense these things. But there is a lot uh, out there, um, uh, uh, and thank God for scientists who are in the faith. You know, so these are well-established scientists, uh, both from the life science stream, biologists, and molecular biology, and so on. And, and there are also scientists from, say, the physics, the engineering side, um, 
who are the astronomy and so on, and who would, who would answer, you know, who would respond to the whole Big Bang theory and so on. So thank God for scientists who are of the faith, and you know, there are a lot of good books out there um, that, uh, that could be referred to uh, and uh, used in, in, in trying to developing a response um, uh, for people. But uh, my goal is to just, you know, point you to, okay, here are some of the answers that we give. But if you want to delve further, and I would encourage you to do that and, you know, uh, develop understanding so that, you know, if you have to speak to people at that level, uh, you know that there are, uh, there is material, there is information uh, that you can tap into and respond. Okay. So um, we're going to start off by uh, looking at now all of these uh uh, these lecture notes I've put up uh, in the uh, in the class book section. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, this is in chapter six now uh, about Darwin and modern evolutionary biology. Now uh, this is actually taken from you know um, the source the resources are given at the end of this article. Uh, but if you're interested, you could read the full article. But I'm just going to be very concisely um, communicate, share with us, you know, how do we respond to this? Okay, just a little understanding, but I'd encourage you to read the full article if you are interested. Um, so Darwin, uh, in, in the 1800s, now Darwin was not the first person to come up with this idea. Uh, as you can see later on in this article, uh, they were predecess predecessors uh, to Darwin who uh, you know, who influenced him, uh, say even his grandfather Erasmus and even much prior to that, there were people who you know, speculated on uh, thoughts that are similar to what Darwin proposed. But Darwin became the, uh, uh, the main proponent of this uh, theory that we refer to as the, uh, uh, um, the theory of descent. That means the how the species evolved over time through a process called natural selection. So uh, the species basically underwent modification to, to, through two primary ways, through variation and selection. So there were variations um, uh, maybe at a gene genetic level or, a, or at a, you know, at a physical level in terms of uh, the structure of uh, parts of their uh, anatomy. Uh, so there were variations and then there was selection, you know, they went through different uh, create situations that, okay, the fittest survived and so on. So this was his whole idea that um, life originated and right life evolved and all the species evolved over time um, through this whole process of natural selection and uh, things evolved. Now, interestingly, uh, Darwin's idea, and of course he put out, you know, uh, these four aspects, which we will just talk, we'll mention briefly how to respond to these, but he put out four main uh, hypotheses or main um, Ba reasons or basis for his theory as to why he was putting this out. Now, very interestingly, Darwin's theory of uh, this whole process of uh, evolution and natural selection has spilled over into other areas of learning, uh, whether we, uh, so we have a social Darwinism or cultural Darwinism. So they began to look at other areas of uh, human evolution, which is uh, in other spaces uh, from that same lens or from that same perspective. And of course, you know, if you want, you can, you know, you can uh, apply that and, and try to create a sequence of uh, events or sequence of uh, developments that seem to indicate that, yeah, there's, there's evolution even here in social evolution or cultural evolution, things have evolved. Uh, the, the fact is, uh, socially and culturally, we are developing, we are ev evolving, and there's nothing wrong with that. But just because uh, we are evolving socially and culturally over time, because so many things are around us are changing, the world today is very different from the world 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago. Uh, and therefore, we have to socially and culturally evolve. Um, 
uh, to adapt to you know all the advancements that are made and the changes that are made. So this is very obvious. Uh, but then to use this as a basis to go all the way back and say, therefore, man evolved from, you know, uh, predecessors such as apes, and then you can go back and back and back and back and you know to wherever like a single cell is like really stretching uh, information uh, beyond its uh, uh, limits of application. But anyway, so uh, Darwin has put out this theory. Uh, many people have uh, added to it, and so we have what is called as the modern evolutionary modern theory of evolution or evolutionary synthesis. Uh, now, when Darwin put it out, uh, he used, uh, you know, these four main findings or reasonings uh, to support what he was saying. Uh, and, and all of this is given in this article. Uh, I'm just, you know, summarizing it and you can read it in depth uh, uh, if you're interested. Uh, first, uh, his first argument was uh, and, and and as you would find in his his books that he wrote, he seemed to be intentionally arguing against the idea of God and creation. So in some way, his books were theological in nature because he was trying to fight against or he was presenting his ideas. And in, often, as you can see some of the quotes there in the article, a lot of his statements were is like trying to disprove the idea of a God and of creation. So uh, in this idea of geographic distribution of species, so what was Darwin saying? It all started in one place and then, you know, evolved and then the species evolved and the species were distributed across different geography, but they all had a common ancestry. Uh, so he was trying to say, okay, look, they all they all started off the same way and they are spread across in different uh, parts of the world and eventually they have adapted to wherever they are. And that's why you have certain kinds of species of animals in certain parts and you don't find them elsewhere. Whereas if it was all created, uh, amidst the, they all started at the same instant, uh, how could you explain, you know, uh, uh, species that are in different parts of, ge in different places geographically, uh, uh, why would, you know, God do something like that, create them different? Um, it was his argument. His, he was using the ge geographical distribution of species as a way to say that they all start in the same way, but then they adapted as they, as they were distributed geographically, uh, they adapted. Uh, but then what we do find is that there are uh, example, flightless birds in different continents. Uh, there are flightless birds in different continents and they are all not very old in age. That means they didn't evolve, you know, very long time in the past. But there, there are flightless birds in different continents. That means it's not about them adapting to the environment, but the fact is they were all created instantly at the same time in, you know, in different parts of the world. So uh, if the, um, the findings don't necessarily corroborate Darwin's theory. So that's one thing, right? Similarly with fossils, he tried to use fossils and I'm just, you know, really summarizing these things so you can read them in detail. Similarly with fossils. Uh, so Darwin said, hey, look, there are fossils and, you know, you can try to, you know, the fossil of the man, I mean, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the human looks very much like a fossil that we found of an ape and so on and so on and so on. But then as far as fossils are concerned, and again, you, there, there's a lot of information out there in fossils and in one of the other notes, I've given you a link. Um, the problem with fossils is there are huge gaps, right? It's not like, it's, it's, it's almost like you're stretching things to try to connect. There are huge gaps that you cannot connect 
to, and try to you know create a storyline from uh, you know as far back as possible and draw it all the way across to the human. So there are huge gaps. Now, Darwin was aware of it, but he just said in his time, and we're talking about almost uh, 200 years ago, at that time he said, okay, you know, we don't have enough uh, uh, of uh, the fossils before the Cambrian age were, or the pre-Cambrian period were destroyed. And so we don't have enough fossils. But then over time, fossils have been found and you don't find the needed connection between fossils to establish scientifically and clearly um, the uh, either the age of the earth or the evolution of man from that of you know prehistoric uh, or, or that of uh, ancestors that go back into the ape and then on backwards so additionally the age of these fossils are a big question. So, uh, yeah. So, so the second uh, hypothesis, the second finding that Darwin was pointing to was that of fossils, and uh, he was uh, trying to use, you know, the existence of fossil findings as uh, as as in support of this whole evolutionary process. Now, of course, that was 200 years ago. A lot more fossils have been found since that time. And uh, uh, the, there are two major problems with fossils. One, as I was saying, um, there are huge gaps uh, in, in this whole chain that um, are the sequence that are being trying to be reconstructed. And secondly, fossils are not as old as they um, was supposed to be. And you have clear examples of uh, uh, even in our time in the last 30, 40 years where, uh, you know, when they first found a fossil, they would say, okay, we, we determined this to be, you know, 64 million years old and uh, it belonged to, you know, and they would give some strange name. Then maybe, you know, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, they will correct themselves and say, okay, this is not what we actually thought. This is not actually, it's just uh, the, the bones of a ape that, you know, in, in, the, in the area in this region that died. So some, uh, 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 not too long ago, okay. Um, so Christopher, I just see a question, which material is being referred to? Are you referring to the, the PDF chapter six or are you, um, uh, are you asking about that or are you asking about the fossils? I'm not sure. We're in chapter six, uh, evolutionary biology. Oh, name the PDF. Okay. Uh, uh, so there's a PDF that's lesson five and six. So uh, so there's one PDF that has both the lessons and we're in, in lesson six on evolutionary biology. Okay. Uh, so that's what we are. So that was, again, uh, an, another area. And there, there are responses to that whole area of fossils. Then the third um, area that uh, Darwin was looking at was, okay, he said, hey, uh, there are vestigial organs. That means these are organs that uh, in the human body uh, are, are not very useful. And of course, he pointed to the appendix as an example. You know, uh, and this was, remember, all of this was 200 years ago and saying, okay, hey, there's a, there are parts in the body that are not very useful. Uh, so therefore, this was this is supporting the idea that um, there is adaptation happening and things that are not needed are, you know, just become vestigial, they become, they put, they go into disuse and eventually the, the species is adapting and changing. Uh, so that was one example. Uh, so he used the presence of what we refer to as, vest as vestigial organs uh, in support of the theory of evolution and adaptation. Um, uh, so what we do know is that even what the, what we think as vestigial organs, they have some value or some part to play in the function of the human body. Uh, so even the appendix has some part to play, okay, powers back. Um, and uh, and so what was initially considered as vestigial, we then later discover that there is some function, there is some 
value associated with it for the human body. And the details I've mentioned there later on in, in, in this article. The last argument that Darwin used was that of homology, which is basically he's saying, uh, you see parts of uh, uh, animals or, you know, so uh, which are similar in structure, uh, they are placed similarly, but they serve different function. So similar structure and location, but different function. So example, the wings of a bat and the flippers of a, you know, a, a sea creature. So the wings and the flippers, uh, similar structure, similar location, but different function. One is used to fly and one is used to swim in, in water or, or maybe even move. Uh, so he was saying, see, this is an example of uh, where uh, there is adaptation because uh, 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 these, these parts are similar, but they are serving a different function. Uh, now, this was, again, this was 200 years ago. Uh, then thereafter, uh, we said, okay, we can look down into, look at the genetic, genetics level to see if there actually has been adaptation that actually has been changed. Or uh, we could look at uh, parts of the body that have similar genetic structure, but they're actually, you know, uh, serving different functions. And so, you know, um, so from a genetics point of view, uh, this argument doesn't hold uh, because you find that there, uh, you know, there, there are uh, and I mentioned this way, let me just be very clear on this. Um, fossils, vestigial organs, and homology, right? So we're talking about structure and position and function. And uh, so if um, homologous structures uh, are produced by similar genes, uh, and non-homologous st structures, that means they don't look the same, but they serve similar function, uh, are produced by different genes that um, then we can say, you know, okay, there has been a common ancestry here. But then from biology, we are able to show this, that uh, non-homologous structures, uh, they look different, very different. The structure is very different, but uh, they are serving similar function. And uh, so legs of mammals, insects, you know, the structure is very different, but they're serving similar function. So from a genetic level, when you look at things, we then that whole, that whole notion or that whole idea, using homology to support evolution, uh, no longer holds. So what we are saying here is that, you know, when you go back to Darwin's theory or what he put out uh, to support his theory of uh, natural, uh, the natural selection, today we can, you know, look at it and say, well, you know, these things don't hold. Uh, we can actually question all of those theories and actually even show evidence uh, that uh, can disprove those notions. I think uh, the bigger question, of course, now we are here 200 years later, uh, you know, Darwin did what he did 200 years ago, but he spawned this whole idea of evolution. And therefore that has become a big, big thing today. But what we can do is, okay, given the information we have today from the scientific field of learning, from a biology perspective, uh, we can ask two big questions, right? Two big questions. So that's all, okay, if, if you're saying things evolved over time and we all have, you know, it all started in a similar way, then let's ask some very basic questions. Let's go down to the very origin of things 
and ask some questions, right? So uh, the first question that we have to ask is, well, we know that all of biological life or you know, biological life has its beginning or is dependent on genetic information. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, there are of course these four major macromolecules, lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids. And uh, all of this depends on genetic information. So the simple question is, where did this intelligence or this information come from? You know, how, how does the DNA know what information to provide? How does it know how to assemble itself and then direct or influence, uh, you know, all the rest of the things that happen in whatever species or whatever level that we're looking at. So where did this information come from is the first basic question. The second basic question is, okay, we are saying at some point there was a transition. So you go back to the very beginning. There was a transition from what we say from non-life to life, from uh, the inanimate to an animate or what we refer to as a prebiotic to a biotic. That means there was a transition from non-living to living. So we are assuming that, that, you know, uh, first there was this non-living material world that came into existence and we will look at the Big Bang to say how, you know, how, what, how that, supposedly happened. So we have this whole non-living material world and somehow from non-living material or pre, a prebiotic state to some unknown, absolutely random phenomena, biological life came into existence or living things came into existence, which even for a single cell is very complicated because you had to assemble chemical compounds into this self-organized, self-replicating, intelligent way. You know, so that is for the first biotic life, for the first cell to come into existence. So how did that happen? Can that be in some way reproduced or reconstructed? Uh, it's impossible, uh, you know, just to say that, you know, we think it's impossible to even show that or reproduce that transition from non-living to living. So these are two big questions, even, you know, not even coming to this whole idea of, okay, there's an evolutionary process of adaptation and selection. Let's go back to the very beginning. There are two fundamental questions that we have to ask and we have, we do not have answers for that. That means biology does not have answers for that. We know what is, what is there. We can tell, you know, what's in the DNA and we know how it works and we know that, okay, or, or not, we're still learning, but for the most part, we know that, you know, the, the, how the genetic codes work and you know, how much of information is compressed into a single DNA strand. And so we can, we, we can say all of that, but how was it that this information came into being like this? Where did this intelligence come from? Could non-material chemical compounds suddenly come together in such an intelligent way and then make it to replicate, reproduce itself. And how could those non-material chemical compounds transition from non-living to living, right? So to sum up, our response uh, to this whole Darwin's theory of evolution would be 
Well, Darwin put out his theory and he had four main findings, so to speak, to try and support his theory. But today, as we examine those findings, all four of those findings are questionable and can be disproved. Okay. But a more fundamental question to ask in the whole against or towards the whole evolution theory is these two questions. Where did this intelligence come from? And how did this transition happen from non-living to living? If that can be explained and uh, not in a way of an hypothesis, but in a way that can be proved, then okay, there's some, you know, we can consider this theory of evolution further on, but this cannot be done, has not been done. And so there's a big question mark against this whole theory of evolution. Now, because the theory of evolution has been extended to many other fields, like we said earlier, to social and cultural revolution, um, uh, a lot of other streams are also being looked at from a similar perspective, right? That uh, from an evolutionary process. So we're talking about cultural Darwinism or social Darwinism. Our response to that is, hey, of course there has to be adaptation and of course there has to be uh, improvements in, in both in uh, social and cultural aspects. But these by themselves cannot prove or cannot be used to substantiate the origin of life the way evolutionary biology claims. Okay. So I'm going to pause here and just uh, open this up for a question, some time of interaction before we move into the next one, which is the Big Bang, which gives us, which is an attempt to explain the origin of the universe. So any questions so far on on the evolutionary biology side? Um, thoughts on it, questions on it? Dinosaurs, yes. Um, we will get to it in our, um, we do evolutionary biology and then we get to the, that is um, lesson number eight, we will answer those questions, but we'll do it. Okay. Anita, what, uh, your question about seeds, uh, what was that? Uh, seeds, if it is sown, no, Pastor, <clears throat> it will break down and it will uh, grow up to be a plant. And again, that circle goes on. So, mm -hmm. uh, would that be a part of like a evolution like that? If in the right circumstances, uh, like uh, atmosphere, it grows to be a tree. Um, Would it be considered as, as a living matter, living substance? See? Yeah. But remember, the seeds have... Uh, um, you know, we could say intelligence encoded inside them, right? So um, even if you break down, uh, you take the seed, you go down to its single cell, there is information encoded inside it, right? Which then basically drives this whole process of germination and so on. So the underlying question we're asking is, where did all that information come from? Genesis 1 says, you know, God created these things. He created, you know, the plants. And so we are saying God is the one who gave that intelligence, who, you know, he created plants, trees, seeds, and he provided all of the intelligence, the design for all of that. 
what evolutionary biology is telling us is all of this happened at random and by chance that these compounds that were there just came together and decided on I mean, somehow got intelligence that then drives the systems and the processes of living things, which includes seeds and other things. So that's the big question. You know, where did this intelligence, how did this intelligence come from for the DNA to be able to encode all of this? And how did it transition from non-material compounds into substances that had life, you know, which cannot be explained. So a seed already has the information in it. And, and our response is, well, God did it there in Genesis chapter one. Yeah. Right, Pastor. Okay. Because uh, when they say about evolution, there has to be some uh, matter, like some sub substance, but they do not uh, explain like from what is the origin of that substance. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to step into, just step in. Uh, we have another 10 minutes and we will do this. Uh, I'm going to step into the next, I want to finish this today. Uh, so next week we'll get into the origin of the Bible, and how the scriptures came to us. So let's try to finish this. Uh, so the other part, uh, and I'm sharing chapter seven, PDF notes, okay? So we looked at evolutionary biology in a very concise way, just address it. We can dig deeper into it. The uh, other scientific hypothesis uh, that tries to attempt, that attempts to explain to us how the universe came into existence you know how did this whole universe come into it? so we are going we are going a step behind which is you now we talked about the origin of life which evolutionary biology attempts to explain now we're going even beyond beyond before that to try to say how does science try to explain the origin of the universe so we call it cosmology how did this whole universe come into being, right? And um, uh, how could we, uh, how could it have happened? So basically the Big Bang Theory, uh, you now, you know, over time, over the, over the decades, yeah, or the, you know, the, the age of the universe has changed considerably. And today, um, uh, what the scientific community uh, accepts is that the age of the universe is about 14 billion years old. And uh, again, the understanding used to change from the universe you know, so at one point, the, the understanding was, well, the universe is in a steady state. Nothing is changing. But then after Einstein came and Einstein put out his theories of relativity and his understanding, then slowly the, uh, um, many scientists began to agree that, no, the universe is not in a steady state. The universe is expanding, increasing, and therefore, if it is increasing, therefore, back in time, it had to have a starting point. So um, that shocked everybody, but scientifically, they said, okay, so that means the universe had a starting point. When they said the universe was in a steady state, then, okay, no worry, don't, don't try to worry about how things began. It was always, it always existed like that. But when, uh, you know, when the understanding changed that no, the universe is expanding, the universe is continuously growing, therefore it has to have a starting point. So then the whole issue, what was the starting point? 
political side. So that whole issue had to be explained. So how is uh, the Big Bang? So the Big Bang Theory is attempt to explain that starting point, right? But there are huge questions around it, and I just mentioned some of the questions. So what what uh, what the Big Bang Theory puts out or is proposing is that the universe began about 14 billion years ago with what is referred to now as a singularity. That means there was a point before time began when there was mass, energy, and space all contained a very hot state. But in a small world, much smaller world than the universe today. The problem is we cannot, or it does not tell us, where was all this mass energy from? Where did it come from? But it's making the assumption that 14 billion years ago, there was this condition of singularity where there was tremendous amount of mass and energy in an extremely hot state, right? And then in, in, a, in time, which would be described as 10 to the power of minus 34, that means one over 10 to the power of 34 zeros. That means in that minute moment of time, All of this energy and mass was released into space. So that's what came to be called as the Big Bang. From that state of singularity, it was in that minute fraction of a second or, you know, a point in time, all of this energy was released. Uh, uh, that that, that caused this universe to come into place. And uh, first the stars came into existence. Uh, you know, the stars came and then from there, from the stars, there because of the heat and uh, various compounds came into existence. And from these, the compounds uh, came matter that created, that caused the formation of planetary bodies like what we have today, like the Earth and other bodies. So that's the whole story, or well, that's the story. Now, there are a lot of issues, questions on it. The very basic question is, which we still haven't answered, is the starting point. So we are saying that there was a starting point. Uh, they claim it's about 14 billion years ago. And we are saying that there was matter and there was uh, energy. But where did this matter and this energy, this intense heat, where did, you know, where did all this come from? Where did this, sing this singularity even appear from? How did it come? You know, and what was this matter all about? What was this energy all about? Right? So, Till now, this cannot be explained. This has not been explained, right? So these earliest moments cannot be explained. We are starting out with a hypothesis or an assumption or a theory of the singularity and then trying to explain how the rest of things would have come into existence. So that's a very basic question, a starting point problem. You know, this is how, how, where did all this come from? Where did this matter come from? And we're talking, no, we're not talking about three or four pieces of carbon atoms. We're talking about huge amounts of matter that would cause huge suns and, you know, all of these things to come into existence. We're talking about huge amounts of energy. We're talking about huge amounts of heat, dense, hot state that could then give birth to stars that we find today, right? So we're not talking about small, tiny, tiny amounts of energy. We're talking about huge amounts of matter energy to cause this universe to come into existence. That cannot be explained, right? So what we're saying is, or what the theory states, of course, is that, okay, so there was this initial explosion 
uh, referred to as a big bang. And then things started cooling down. And then there were these subatomic and atoms coming into existence out of the heat and the cooling down process. And, and these initial elements came into being. Hydrogen came in, helium came in, lithium came in. Uh, uh, you know, we're not really sure how these things came in, but they came in because there was, we are presupposing the existence of matter. We are presupposing that these particles began to form and came into existence. And uh, then came gravity. Again, how did it come? We don't know, but gravity came into existence. Uh, we can explain gravity in terms of magnetic forces, but what caused these magnetic forces to come into existence? We don't know. And then from there come the, uh, you know, so the sequence continues, the stars and the galaxies, and then the planetary bodies, right? So uh, along with these, there are, uh, this is being made, we're calling the dark matter, unknown things that are you know, slowly beginning to, uh, uh, people are beginning to understand things, okay? They're, all of these things exist. But now there are basic questions, uh, and, and there are obviously more, so if you, if you kind of read more in depth uh, on these things, you will find uh, information. But basically, and these are from, from scientific questions, right? Uh, where what we are saying is, okay, we, we are presupposing so many things are there, but if you're presupposing, where are they now, right? So, and I'm just mentioning four, and this is just taken from a very simple, you know, we're trying to explain it as simple as possible. Um, so there are, for example, missing monopoles. So the, the uh, idea is that uh, from these high temperatures, uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, the Big Bang took place, magnetic monopoles should have been created. That means these are magnetic particles that have a single pole, either a north or a south pole. So this is part of the hypothesis. We're saying, okay, these should have been created, but we hardly find any of them today, right? So we are saying they were created as part of this whole process and they're supposed to be very stable, but then if they were there, where are they today? So that's a question. And similarly like that, again, there's this whole thing of when matter, hydrogen and helium is created, experimental physics says, when you're creating matter from energy, there's also something called antimatter that's produced. So what we are saying is, at some point, energy transitioned to matter. And experimentally, we found that when you're creating matter from energy, you're also going to produce antimatter. So now you extrapolate what you have found in the lab to what we are saying, to the hypothesis saying, well, if we are saying that in the Big Bang, there was huge amounts of energy, which then gave rise to matter, there should have been a lot of antimatter also produced, equal amounts of antimatter. Unfortunately, we don't find that. We don't find equal amounts of antimatter, which we have experimentally proved we don't find it in the universe. So that's again a big question mark. Third question mark, and these are just four I'm mentioning. There are a lot more from a scientific perspective. Pe people can ask questions. Uh, a fourth uh, question mark is what I refer to as population three stars. So again, here we are saying that uh, these elements came into existence. Uh, the, these, the, the lightest, three lightest elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium, uh, came into existence. And then from them came the heavier elements, uh, which uh, the stars produced. So we have second and third generation stars. 
But then what about the initial stars? So, which were first formed. And if we are saying stars are, you know, if our Earth is just about 14 billion years old, and the lifespan of these stars are longer, or, or, or at least equal to that, sorry, then these initial stars should have been around, should be around, but they're not there. We don't find those stars. We have just these other stars that are, have other uh, elements as well. So that's another question. We don't find these population three stars hanging around today. And uh, the last one is that uh, uh, the, the, the universe suddenly appeared, like we said, you know, in this fraction of a, uh, less than a second. Uh, and we call this as a, 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 a cosmic inflation. So the problem is um, extreme ends of our universe are at the same temperature. So how could it be that uh, this hot, hot, hot universe that or from this hot state, the universe expanded um, and uh, how could we have these extreme ends at the same temperature? But they never had the chance to, you know, have some sort of a thermal equilibrium. So there was a physicist, Alan Good, who came up with this idea of a cosmic inflation. That means, he said, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, that it took just about one in 10 to the power of 34 seconds uh, for the universe to expand and inflate, uh, uh, which is infinitely faster than the uh, speed of light. And so at that moment, it was possible for these extreme ends of this universe, uh, you know, therefore the, the extreme ends of this universe, it was possible for them to be in contact with each other before being pulled out to these extremely distant points in space. And therefore, because of this cosmic, you know, this cosmic infl inflation, which took place in such a small amount of time, therefore, the, the hypothesis is they are at the same temperature levels. Now, it's a theory, but there's no way to prove it, right? So through this theory, he's saying that because the universe expanded so quickly, we have extreme parts of the universe in the same temperatures, but there is no way to actually prove it. Uh, so the challenge is, how is it that different extreme parts of this universe are at same temperatures. Uh, if, you know, there was this whole random explosion from this point of singularity. In other words, we are assuming that, you know, we are stating there's this huge random explosion. And yet at the same time, there is this equilibrium we are finding in the universe. So you're saying something that happened from random resulted in this wonderful equilibrium. How, how is that possible? So somebody has come up with a theory of this cosmic inflation, but you can, cannot prove that theory of cosmic inflation. We just know that our universe is in this wonderful state of equilibrium, even though it supposedly started out with this huge explosion, random, uncontrolled explosion, right? So that's the challenge. So the point, and, and you can read a lot more information here. 
uh, on these websites and in the books. Um, if you're interested, I could give you names of books. Maybe I can put that out somewhere. So the the, the main thing I want to get across, uh, we will take a break. I know we are already 10 minutes over, but we'll take a break. The main thing I want to get across here, as far as the Big Bang Theory cosmology is, there's a big problem as far as the starting point itself. We are making an assumption that everything came, was there for it to start off with. And then when you look at the rest of the process, the explanation of, okay, how did things evolve? You know, okay, you have energy and matter and space, but how did materials come into existence? How did these stars come into existence? And how did these planetary bodies all around us come from that explosion. So of course, the, uh, uh, you have lots of theories that ex try to explain all this, but then at each point, you know, we can raise questions and there are very simple questions that, okay, you're saying monopoles were created, but where are they today? Uh, we have experimentally proved that if you're moving, going from energy to matter, you always produce antimatter, but we don't find that in our universe. So what do we have to say when we have so much of energy being changed to matter, there's hardly any antimatter. What about the stars? We are saying stars, uh, you know, they have generation of stars, but where are the early generation of stars? Where are they? And then how is it that there's equilibrium in our universe if there was an explosion, uh, a random explosion uh, that caused everything to come into play. Uh, now they do have this theory of cosmic inflation, but then there's no way to prove that uh, and so on. So the point I want to get across is that there are scientists Specific questions we can ask in response to every step in this whole theory of, cos of cosmology, uh, 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 in Big Bang theory of cosmology, that we can ask, uh, which cannot be answered. And so, you know, uh, while while it sounds scientific. Uh, we will see in the next chapter that actually there are there are a lot of things that are being said that are not necessarily scientific. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is um, um, we will take a break now. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll back in 10 minutes, we come back at 10, 10, you know, I'm taking 10 minutes extra. We'll, we'll come back at 10, 10, and uh, we'll just keep it up time, keep it time for questions. And, um, and then we'll get to our last uh, chapter in this whole thing on the origin of life and creation. Okay. Um, sorry, I had to take 10 minutes extra. Have a 10 minute break and we'll be back. Okay. Thanks.